Hello, and welcome back to Mass Office Hours. This week, most of the Mass team is traveling due to the holidays, so for that reason, we are bringing you a special pre-recorded episode of Mass Office Hours. Uh, and not only that, this special episode actually comes straight from a previous issue of the Mass Research Review. So if you've never been subscribed to the Mass Research Review, every month on the first of the month, we publish a number of articles about the newest studies in exercise and nutrition, but we also have one or two videos in each issue of Mass. So if you've never been subscribed to Mass, this video lecture gives you a little sneak peek into what each issue of Mass actually looks like. So this video lecture is by Dr. Eric Helms, and it's about client-centered coaching. And I know a lot of you are probably thinking, well, I don't coach other people. This probably doesn't apply to me, so I'll just skip it and come back next week. I would encourage you to give it a listen, even if you're not coaching other people at the moment. And the reason for that is, uh, if you do your own training and your own nutrition programming, you're essentially coaching yourself. And if you're in that situation, I think you're going to get a lot from some of the concepts and theories that are discussed in this video. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy, and the whole Mass team hopes that you and your families have happy holidays. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to my 2023 April video for this issue, Real World Client-Centered Coaching. I'm actually really excited about this video because it puts something uh, into more practical terms that we've covered a lot in mass. Way back, I believe in our second volume, I did a video series on sustainable motivation for fitness. And in it, I discussed a lot of things related to uh, the motivation that people have to pursue fitness-related goals, and then how we as coaches can support it. And from there, uh, Eric Trexler has actually stepped in and really kind of carried the torch in kind of the coaching realm and the human motivation and goal setting realm with some great recent articles that he wrote uh, in the last volume, primarily volume six, where he talked about aspects of autonomy, supportive coaching, uh, person-centered or client or athlete-centered coaching, and tying in a lot of these models into giving people a really clear theoretical understanding and how it leveraged uh, the data we have on goal setting uh, and really just giving you a great background. And I thought, you know what I could do with this video is to really bring it down to the brass tacks. What does it look like when you're actually posting on a social media site to try to get clients, actually sending an email response to a client check-in, uh, actually being at a powerlifting mute, a meet and, and queuing one of your athletes, etc. And I really hope what this video does is it reviews some of the theory, helps you understand really what it is to be a good coach, uh, which I think inherently requires you to be, you know, in service to your athletes and being therefore athlete or client centered. Uh, and then what does that actually mean in practice? So uh, I'm really trying to bridge a gap here and I hope that this presentation will do that. And I'm excited because I think it will. So what we're going to cover uh, in, in the outline of this video, we're going to first talk about what makes a good coach. And once we realize what makes a good coach, then we need to think about, okay, for those qualities, what should they be based on or at least informed by? And that inherently means the understanding of the motivation which drives people to do hard things because ultimately that's what people hire coaches. They need to successfully lose weight and keep it off, which we know is you know, a, a very difficult journey that many people don't actually succeed at or participate and win in sport, which is a competitive environment where it is to some degree a zero-sum game. And if you have to go farther, you have to beat someone else or be better than someone else. And not everyone succeeds in sport to the same level. So how do people do these hard things? And once we understand what it is that motivates people to change their behavior or do very hard things, then how can a coach facilitate them to more consistently do those hard things? How can we be there to support that motivation? And then from there, we're going to understand that while our role is critical, because this is about supporting someone else's motivation, it's not actually about us. And we can start to look into the qualities of really good client or athlete or person-centered coaches. Uh, and then from there, once we really review and understand kind of the underlining theoretical model that we've talked about across the whole span of mass, bringing it together in this video, then I want to give you some uh, four real-world examples. We're going to talk about how your marketing can impact client expectations. We're going to talk about the expectations that you put on your clients and how that can impact the data they give you. 
Uh, we're going to talk about how your cues in the actual setting with an athlete, if you're an in-person personal trainer, uh, or if you're a, a platform coach, um, how that actually impacts performance. And then we're going to talk about how your clients are motivated and how you can have an impact on their motivation and how that can lead to success or not. So let's get into it. First, what makes a good coach? And this is more of an anecdotal observation. Uh, and this is that in my experience, every good coach I've ever met, every successful coach, even maybe not even good, but just successful, they have a coaching philosophy. They can articulate it at least to some degree. They've thought about it and their actions and decisions are based on it. And a great example of that is John Wooden. Uh, if you're not familiar with John Wooden, uh, rest in peace, he is a legendary coach. And this image from uh, the Coach John Wooden's website uh, shows that he has a very strong philosophy. You can see here he has his well-known pyramid of success for the attributes of people who are successful. Uh, he has his 12 lessons on leadership. He has a quote, and it's all very much value-based. And you can see that he's clearly put a lot of thought into his philosophy for the way he operates. And one thing that John Wooden will say is that he tries to help people become good people first, and then from there, they become good athletes. And this is not to say that everything's just based upon what John Wooden thinks works, but it is an example of a philosophy. And again, just if you don't know who John Wooden is, uh, for 12 years, he was a basketball coach for the UCLA Bruins. That's a uh, NCAA team in the U.S. in L.A. at University of California, Los Angeles. It's a pretty big school. And in the 12 years that he was the coach, 10 of them, they won national titles. And this is a record. Seven of them were in a row. And I believe it is also a record that uh, they won at the highest amount of consecutive winning games of 88 wins in a row. So he was very successful. And I, in my experience, most successful coaches uh, do have an underlying philosophy. And since this is mass and we have to take a very evidence-based approach, first off, I want to say that your individual philosophy should be based upon your values and it will differ from coach to coach. And that's 100% fine. In fact, it's good. It's necessary because not everyone has the same values and you can only be honest, build rapport, build trust, and act in confidence when you're acting based upon your values. But in addition to that, I think you want to have an evidence-informed approach to understanding human motivation and behavior change, because ultimately, that's what you're in the business of. So first, we have to really understand how do people accomplish hard things? Uh, like I mentioned in the outline, people who are able to lose a lot of weight and keep it off, on average, unfortunately, they are the minority. So how do they do that? People who win world championships or even national titles or even just become an elite level lifter, they're rare. They're the minority of lifters. How do they do that? What sets them apart besides factors like genetics, uh, you know, and, and things like that? Um, but how do people continue just to strive and improve even regardless of the level they, they achieve? That's challenging. Most people don't participate in sport after school or as an, as an adult and continue to improve. Many people drop out, burn out, don't have the time for it, or just can't stick to it. In bodybuilding, for example, I would say the majority of people who set out for a prep their first time don't actually get on stage. So how is it that people do these hard things? Not everyone seems to be able to do it. And our best understanding of that to date is something called self-determination theory, which I, again, I think the first time it was introduced to mass was in my video back in the second volume, but we've expanded on it a lot. And Eric Trexler has done a great job talking about it. Uh, and there is data to support it, which I'll discuss in a second. But the model, the theoretical underpinning of it is that human motivation, your motive to do something, um, comes from three different areas and those three things all being manifested at the same time to equal degrees, and that is autonomy, feeling like you're in charge of your own life, that it's your decision to pursue this goal. Uh, competence, that the pursuit of the goal is something that you can get better at, that there's some type of skilled activity involved, regardless of what the activity is, but you feel like you're becoming more and more competent from it. And that helps you make meaning out of the activity and it makes you feel like a self-actualized person. And then in addition, that you're understood in that process, perhaps not by the outsiders, but at least other people who are doing it. Um, you know, in, in the lifting community, we're relatively small, especially among competitors. Not everyone gets what we do, um, but the people who do get it, we feel a sense of relatedness to. We feel understood by our pursuit of this. And humans are inherently social creatures. Even the introverted members of our species are, are inherently social. 
So having relatedness, being understood, being seen, being acknowledged, and then also feeling a sense of competence and feeling like you're in charge of your life, when these three things combine, that leads to much stronger motivation. Additionally, uh, like I said, this isn't just theory. We do have data to back it up. The first large-scale data set I was aware of uh, was a systematic review which compiled it all a little over a decade ago by Teixeira and colleagues. And just to quote their their abstract, uh, overall, the literature provides good evidence for the value of SDT or self-determination theory in understanding exercise behavior, demonstrating the importance of autonomous, identified and intrinsic, which we'll talk about in a second, regulations and fostering physical activity. So essentially, the systematic review looked at a broad range of things in the physical activity literature, including exercise, and said, you know, a lot of this seems to be impacted by facets of self-determination theory and explained by. So there is empirical support for this theoretical underpinning, and that's why it's been around for decades now, and it's been studied increasingly in the exercise and nutrition field for good reason because of that. Now, like I said, I said we get into it in a moment, and that is, they put in parentheses, something about intrinsic motivation. So as posited by self-determination theory, there are different types or qualities of motivation. On the far left is when you have no motive to do something. You have a motivation. That's a lack thereof of motivation. You have no reason to do it. You're not interested in it. So you're not going to change that behavior or participate in it, whatever the context is. And then we have extrinsic motivation. And this is anything that is outside of your internal drive to do something. But really, the highest quality motivation is what we call intrinsic motivation. This means that the person, for whatever their personal reason, whatever it means to them, is pursuing this goal because it's important to them and it has inherent or intrinsic value. Now, it's difficult to identify some types of extrinsic motivation from intrinsic motivation. If someone is really intrinsically motivated to be a champion... They're motivated by winning, but is getting the trophy really the same thing as winning? Is the glory or the clout really the same thing as winning? What does winning mean to that person? So it's not always 100% clear, but I like to use a simple litmus test in that if we removed all of the external things that you get, uh, professional athletes, money, the actual title, the actual physical reward they're getting, uh, maybe the, the social media followers that come from it, would they still do it? Would they still pursue it? And if the answer is yes, that means a large part of the reason why they're doing it is intrinsic motivation. And that example right there explains its value, meaning that it's very hard to chip away at this core of intrinsic motivation that is driving you to do something that is inherently hard. So if we can help our athletes or our clients develop intrinsic motivation, it becomes far more unshakable. Now, it's not to say that it can't change or morph or shift. One thing that I have talked about in prior mass content is when you start to reward a behavior that started intrinsically, it can make part of it extrinsic. And we've heard stories of this. We've seen examples of it. You know, once an athlete who just loved to lift weights starts competing and doing really well, they start to chase the win or they chase the clout or they enjoy those things and it starts to distract them or subvert their intrinsic motivation. So this is not just a quality of motivation, but it is something to be fostered, paid attention to, and facilitated, and try to maintain in that category of intrinsic motivation. And it's not that extrinsic motivation is bad. Uh, You know, if you can have a solid set of extrinsic motivators on top of intrinsic motivation, that's fine, especially if they're not subverting intrinsic motivation. So that's just a better idea of how we classify motivation and how it is very individual. And as coaches, that's what we're supporting. And that's where I think we really need to understand what it is to be a coach who facilitates the success of an athlete. And if you look in the self-determination theory literature and the coaching literature that's based upon this theory, a common term you'll come across is what's called autonomy supportive coaching. And indeed, autonomy support is something that has now been studied. So once self-determination theory was identified and empirically supported, Then we said, oh, hey, well, it makes sense that a coach, if we want to be changing behavior and helping people find strong motives to do hard things, they need to be supporting self-determination theory. And that's where the term autonomy support came from. So this is actually a more recent meta-analysis and not just systematic review. They actually had some quantitative analyses uh, by Mosman and colleagues. It just came out last year. Autonomy support in sport and exercise settings, a systematic review and meta-analysis. 
And this is a really big data set. It has nearly 40,000 participants across a large different uh, set of samples looking at a lot of different outcomes. And actually, Dr. Trexler, he reviewed it recently, and his key points really kind of get at some of the, uh, the, the main findings that really show the importance and the role of a coach and how they can facilitate success. Before I get into those key points, though, I just want to point out a couple of key things. So indeed, they found that SDT, or uh, self-determination theory, consistent with that theory, autonomy support was correlated with intrinsic motivation, and it was negatively correlated with a motivation, and it was w- more weakly correlated with ex- extrinsic motivation. So indeed, the action of a coach in providing autonomy support supports the highest quality motivation, which therefore leads to success. And a really interesting thing, if you look at the bottom of the abstract, they note this does not seem to be moderated by culture. Both collectivist and individualist cultures, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, both seem to have this relationship. So this is an intrinsic human quality. Even if you come from a society where you're taught culturally to focus more on how you can help the society as a whole, or if you come from a society which focuses more on your individual expression, uh, your uniqueness, and your ability to succeed. Um, I'm not going to provide you know broad sweeping strokes and get it wrong about typically what is a collectivist culture or a individualist culture, but generally, and I can say this because I'm part of it, uh, Western cultures are a little more individualist, uh, and there are other co- you know cultures around the world that, that fall somewhere along the spectrum. But the important thing is this seems to be a cross cultural phenomenon. Uh, that self-determination theory is intrinsically human and to our best understanding right now, and therefore a coach who supports uh, self-determination theory and their athletes will be successful. And that is exactly the key point that I wanted to get into. Eric's uh, last tr- key point here, self-determination theory yields uh, very simple and practical strategies that can facilitate the successful implement- implementation of a great program, ultimately supporting a lifter's subjective experience, general well-being, and intrinsic motivation, which can provide a solid solid foundation for long-term success. And indeed, there were relationships showing, showing better performance in this as well. So if you're thinking about the bottom line and not all this touchy-feely psychology stuff, absolutely. A more motivated athlete is going to be a better performing athlete, and that's what we're trying to support. And to give even more um, understanding of where your actual opportunities to intervene might be, I think another, this is another figure from one of Eric's articles, is the COM-B model, which is also an empirically supported understanding and SDT-related understanding of human behavior. And it actually brings in some of the logistics. It talks about the things that lead to motivation and behavior change also include capability, which has a lot of overlap with competence, uh, motivation again. Uh, so if you have the motivation and the capability to do something, you're more likely to do that behavior, and also the opportunity. So now this is actually looking at at barriers, logistical barriers to someone's ability to succeed or participate in something, uh, because a lot of the times people can't engage in healthy eating or exercise because they may not have the money, the access, they may not be in a walkable city, uh, they might be in a food desert, et cetera, et cetera, or they may not have the knowledge, the capability that they could get from a coach. They don't have the cooking skills, right? And those things can impact not only behavior, but also motivation, uh, because it seems, you know, just this really steep hill to climb. So then the behavior doesn't change, they don't get the positive reward, and they don't therefore get the motivation. You can see there's these two-way arrows uh, between motivation and behavior and opportunity and capability and behavior. So it really helps to explain this ecosystem of what leads to behavior change and motivation. And like I said, there is empirical support for COM-B as well. And the reason why I wanted to bring up COM-B is because it's almost a checklist for coaches. You can go, look, okay, Is there a capability issue here? Can I be an educator? Can I help them better understand how to do this? Is there an opportunity issue here? Do they not have the resources they need? So education and resources uh, or or clarification of how to help an athlete get to get to certain resources are huge roles for a coach and, and great places where they can be of service. And those things then lead to motivation and motivation leads to behavior change. But like I said, there is empirical support for Combi as well. Uh, this uh, survey by Wilmot and colleagues, uh, looked, which only came out in 2021, so relatively recently, looked at around 1,000 primarily female uh, college student age folks participating in healthy eating or physical activity, and they wanted to look at the relationships between the COM-B model to see how much of those key factors actually explained the term in terms of the variance in a cross-sectional survey 
of behavior change. So is the COM-B model sufficient to at least cross-sectionally show strong associations with behavior change? Is it actually the barriers that they face? Is that related to opportunity? Uh, is, is motivation a factor? And is their capability to do things a factor? And indeed, they found that uh, the the COM-B model explained 31 and 23% of the variants respectively of participating in physical activity uh, or not, so the barriers to it, or healthy eating. And those are pretty strong values. So those are that's the variance. So that is actually the R-squared value. So the, if they just reported the, the straight-up relationship, it would be moderate. And it's explaining a, a notable portion of the reason why people do or don't or stop or start participating in physical activity. So this is giving us the at least the cross-sectional relationship uh, evidence to support the COMBI model, showing us that, hey, you know, if people have the opportunities or the uh, motivation uh, or the capability to do something, that co-varies with them actually doing it. Or if they don't have those things, not doing it. And it explains a good chunk of that variance. So at this point, hopefully I've convinced you and some of these basic theoretical underpinnings of why it's important to support an athlete's uh, autonomy, uh, competence, and help them find relatedness so they can be motivated and also help them facilitate the capability and the opportunities to support their motivation to hopefully get to behavior change and why you want to help them get to intrinsic motivation. So I'm kind of just rehashed everything we've talked about in mass, a combination of both myself and Dr. Trexler, so that we can go, okay, so I understand what I'm theoretically supposed to do as a coach. And then we go, okay, well, how does that lead us to, to person-centered or athlete-centered or client-centered coaching? And the revelation here is that your role is critical, as we see here. You know, uh, autonomy-supported coaching is empirically supported. The combi model is empirically supported. You can really help people do things, but inherent in these models, autonomy-supportive, it's not about you. Your role is to be in service. And then we have to think about, okay, so what does that mean? What do, I, what do I spend my time doing? What should my philosophy, my approach, my stance be when I'm working with athletes? And that's essentially asking the question, what is a person or athlete or client-centered coach? What is client-centered coaching? And also, another great article written by, uh, by Dr. Trexler it was a qualitative study of what known, capable, successful person-centered coaches did. And they found that uh, in, their, in, in watching them interact with athletes, they had what they called the POWA model of humility, or P-O-W-A. And these were characteristics that these coaches, co- coaches embodied. And that was P, perspective, uh, stepping back to see the bigger picture, seeing things objectively. They were other-centered focus. They were making decisions that were about the athlete and intended to benefit the athlete or the, or the team they were working with rather than themselves, not what's best for me as a coach. They had a willingness to learn. They understood that, look, if it's not about me and it's about me supporting the athlete or the coach or the person, I need to learn more about them. And they are the key to me learning more about them because they know more about themselves than anybody. So they had you know, a vulnerable, open kind of type of communication. They, they sought feedback. They were open to it. Uh, and they also wanted to acknowledge their own mistakes. So they were really working on building a good rapport and trust. And then also accurate self-assessment. So they didn't let their ego get in the way. Because again, it's not about you. It's not about the coach. Bringing your ego into it is just going to blind you to own your own opportunities to improve. So you know not only your, your strengths, but also your weaknesses. And when it's not about you, and it's not about feeling like a competent coach, and you're not protecting your own perception of self, you can do things like go, you know what? We would be, be better with a dietitian on the team. You know what? We need a physical therapist. This is beyond my scope. You know what? I think I know a great mental skills uh, sports psychologist who, who can work with you. Uh, there are limits to my skills. I have strengths, and I'm going to capitalize on those, but I also have weaknesses. And you should know what they are so that you know how I can serve you best. And where I can't, let's bring someone else in. And those are just examples of how this model of humility works. And how a person-centered or client or athlete-centered coach can put them so, can put their athletes in the best position to succeed by having this kind of philosophy and approach. Okay, I promise I'm done now with the theoretical underpinning and understanding what the heck it is to be a good coach and which means being a client-centered coach and what that might look like. But now I really want to get into the nitty-gritty and we're going to get into some real-world examples. And we're going to start with before you even have a client or maybe while you're trying to get a new client before someone is a client, 
and the actual aspects of being on social media and posting to attract new clients and follow up on leads. And that is the omnipresent on social media before and after. And of course, this is going to be a little tongue in cheek, and we're going to start with more egregious examples and then get into more murky waters. Okay, so just to, to, to plant that seed. So the first one is little old me. And this is, of course, a fictitious before and after if you read the caption. This is actually a picture of me, I think, after close to two years of lifting. I'd done my dreamer bulk. I thought I was probably like 10% body fat here on the left. I was up around 100 kilos or 220 pounds. I had no business being that big yet. Um, and I thought I was was huge and had all the muscle. Uh, and then this is actually 13 years later on uh, in my 2019 season. Um, anyway, but if we read the caption... This is the coach posting this. Using my one-week transformation program, Eric won the INBF River City Classic Bodybuilding Competition. That's actually true. All of the pictures from a different competition. Uh, this win was just one of 24 overall wins I coached this month as head coach of Team Easy Shreds. Eric is a great athlete because he put his head down and executed the plan I laid out to a T and was rewarded because of it. DM for inquiries, only serious applicants accept it. Now, let's point out some things. First, I will say that this absolutely works. Of course, this is a little bit of an extreme, facetious, silly example that is poking fun at some of the stuff we see on Instagram. But honestly, and unfortunately, it's not far from the truth. But the key things I want you to focus on are not the silliness, like the one-week transformation, but this win was just one of 24 overall wins I coached this month. So the coach is positioning themselves as the arbiter of success of their athletes and showing how many people they've coached. And that is absolutely impressive to potential clients, um, but that comes at a cost. Uh, they position themselves as the head coach, and they explain that, sure, Eric's a great athlete, but it's because he put his head down, he was subservient to me, and he followed the plan I laid out to a T. This was about him executing what I told him to do, and that's why he was rewarded. And then notice, DM for inquiries, only serious applicants accepted. That is basically code, especially coming after that paragraph of saying, I only want people who are going to do exactly what I say. Now, like I said, this works, but it works in the short term, and it depends on the coach whether this is actually worth it or useful. So some coaches are actually relatively client-centered and might post a before and after kind of like this because they know this marketing works and they position themselves, and they're going to be in for some troubled waters once, once they actually convert a client. Others are just absolutely not client-centered coaches. They're authoritarian coaches, and they will get into trouble because their reputation is only going to last so long. That's the most valuable asset they have. But let's think about what would a client, a potential client, think reading this. They're going to think, oh, that coach is a wizard. I can't wait to see them work their magic. They have the keys. Success is guaranteed. This coach makes all his clients win. So it works the way you've positioned yourself as the person who is getting these results for the clients, they're, they're only winning because of following what you said, will make clients think exactly that. So the good news is, is that you get to take credit for all of their success. But when a client comes to you and they don't succeed, they're going to expect the same thing. It was you who failed, not me. You're the one who's supposed to be coaching me to win. I follow your plan to a T. If it doesn't work, it's on you. So the issue here is that if it's all about the coach, not just success is about the coach, but also failure. And that's going to be a problem. Now, this is especially problematic if you are actually a client-centered coach, but you've just kind of bought into that style of marketing because you think it works. Because what someone will absolutely not expect from that type of marketing is that when you sit down with them on the first call and you start asking them questions and you try to individualize the plan and you ask them, what do they like? What's their history? What works best for you? And you go, you know what? We're going to start out. I'm going to get a feel for you and it's going to get better over time. They're going to go, wait a minute. I thought you had the keys. I thought you were a wizard. What about your magic? Why are you asking me questions? I'll do whatever you say. So that can be something you can turn around in that conversation and maybe they get it. But essentially, your actual service doesn't, market, doesn't match your marketing. It's false advertising for what you actually do if you're a client-centered coach. And I am not saying you can't do before and afters or you can't advertise or you can't put testimonials from your clients up, but there's a better way to do it that shows what you're actually about that's probably just as successful, maybe not quite as successful in the short term, but will probably get you more conversions because there's more congruence between what you're selling and what you're actually giving people. So let's take a look at how we might modify this. Eric won the INBF River City Bodybuilding Competition, and it was a privilege to be in his corner. He had a goal, 
sought me out to collaborate on a plan to achieve it, and he did through hard work and consistency. I've learned a lot from our partnership, and I'm looking forward to supporting Eric's future successes. DM for inquiries, how can I help you achieve your goals? So notice that this is still a very impressive, you know, before and after. Maybe not if you tell them it was after 13 years, uh, but you get the point. Like you can put an impressive client forward. You can acknowledge that you work together. You can still make it about the client. You can celebrate the client. The client will feel good about it. You'll feel good about it. And it will show that you are successful, right? But you're successful in supporting this person. And that gives the right message to the client. The only thing maybe you're missing here is you didn't have the opportunity to say, oh, I did 24 you know, pro cards or wins. And yeah, you're going to have to make con- some concessions to be a client-centered coach, but it's absolutely going to be, be worth it in the long term. You're not going to sit down when you convert the client and you have your first call and then be surprised when you start asking them questions and trying to collaborate with them. I mean, look, before they're even your client, you're asking them, how can I help you achieve your goals? They're going to be 100% expecting that once they actually get on a call with you, once they receive their first email, et cetera, that it's going to be collaborative, that you're going to be eliciting information from them, and that they're going to be involved in that process. So like I'm saying, you don't have to not do testimonials, not do before and afters, not market on social media, and not show client successes, but you just want to do it in a way that is congruent your philo- with your philosophy and actually helps clients understand the way you operate, and it's a better way to operate. So the next example is actually an interaction with a client. This might be uh, an example of how a coach sets expectations and how it can impact in ways they might not expect the reliability of the data they get. So let's read this interaction here. So client just checked in, name is Tom. The coach responds, Tom, you didn't stick to the plan over the weekend. Again, as a result, your rate of weight loss is behind schedule. I know what you need to do to succeed, but if you don't follow my plan, it won't work. Next week, let's hit the macros within five grams as I instructed. Don't let me down. Now, we're getting a little less facetious, a little less extreme, but this type of communication absolutely does happen. I've unfortunately seen it forwarded to me or even been around it when I was a personal trainer. Uh, the coach here is actually leveraging the relationship, maybe even you know to, to be charitable, hoping it'll actually help the client stick to their plan and they'll get the results they want. They're actually saying, don't let me down, Right. But think about the position this puts the client in if they're not able to hit the macros within five grams, as I instructed. I know it's a ridiculous example or a very, very tight example if it's not like a bodybuilder is six weeks out. Um, And it is a little facetious, but don't focus on that too much. Think about the situation. If the client can't hit the targets again, and it sounds like this has been happening multiple times, so it's actually a high probability of that, you've put them in a lose-lose situation. If they can't hit it, they know what's going to happen they've let you down. You're going to be disappointed in them and they're going to feel bad. So they're going to think, crap, I couldn't hit my targets within five grams this week either. Coach is going to be mad. Hmm. And that hmm represents the fact that now they have a choice between two losing scenarios. Do I come to my coach, have him disappointed in me, maybe fire me or just berate me or make me feel bad and I'll be, I'll be shamed? Or do I lie? Do I put down that I hit my macros within five grams? And if I haven't made, you know, success this week, I haven't, if I hadn't hit the weight loss target, I say something like, I'm not sure what's going on. You know, maybe my, my neat's down. Maybe I'm having, you know, metabolic adaptation. You know, is it possible that the, you know, birth control I'm on or whatever, they'll find some way to explain it. And yeah, there, you could be like, oh, that client shouldn't be dishonest. But, but what position have you put them in? They can either be dishonest which is a lose. They're going to feel shame for that or feel shame for letting you down. Probably the best option for them is just to ghost you and not respond and find a new coach. So it's really a lose, lose, lose. And I think to some degree, you can't fault the client for doing that. So by creating an environment where the client is going to feel shitty about failing more than they already probably feel about it, you're actually impinging upon the reliability of your data. And you can't even trust necessarily what you're getting. And then you can't help them anymore because you don't know the cause of why they're stalled. Now you can't actually even do your job. So let's think about a different way to respond. Tom, thanks for checking in and being honest about your nutrition struggles this weekend. You sounded frustrated with yourself because this happened again. But give yourself some grace. This isn't easy. Would you like to jump on a call by chance? I'd love to hear what you think are the major obstacles on the weekend. And if you'd like, we can brainstorm solutions. 
Also, might be worth revisiting your goals. I'd be curious to hear how you feel about them. It has been six months since you initially set them. Notice the language here is all about Tom. You have no inkling here that the the coach is disappointed in the person. They're not leveraging the the emotional relationship to make the person feel bad and put pressure on them to do it right. Um, they acknowledge, in fact, that hey, you know, you're probably frustrated, and you express that in your email. And you know what? That's that's rough. And they're going, you know, I don't need to pile on the client anymore. And then they're saying, hey, would you like, asking permission even, to jump on a video call? I'd love to hear what you think are the major obstacles on the weekend. And here, that's exactly what a person-centered coach would do. They're going, you know what, this person is the one who's, who's struggling. They're very aware of what this obstacle is. They can't get over it. They're looking at it in the face. Maybe if they tell me what the obstacle is, I can help them think differently about it for my objective or more objective position. Um... Also, they very astutely are noticing that, you know what, sometimes adherence issues are related to the goal. If it's been six months, as it apparently has been in this example, of, the, of talking about the goals and setting them, perhaps the goals have shifted. Maybe Tom doesn't actually really want to lose weight anymore. He's been loving making progress in the gym, and he wants to do a powerlifting meet. He wants to actually eat for performance and focus on PRs. And maybe if you sit down and talk to him about that, and you help him set a new goal of doing a powerlifting meet next year, all of a sudden his nutrition is on point because he's seeing it as a way to support his strength gains rather than trying to get leaner. Maybe he's happy with where he's at or just doesn't feel as motivated to get really, really lean anymore. He's found a new relationship with the reason he's training. But you can't know that unless you actually sit down and ask and talk to them. So this is a great example of how interacting with someone a little differently can result in a very different outcome. And you're going to get far more reliable data. You're creating an environment of trust. It's non-judgmental. So they can tell you when they screwed up. The only time they can't is when they won't even admit it to themselves, which admittedly does happen. But your goal is not to put additional barriers in them being honest with themselves. It's to encourage them to be honest with you and as honest with themselves as they can be. So let's move on to a less clear-cut example. And this is something that I see every single time I go to a meet, and it is something a lot more innocuous. And it may even seem initially like it's disconnected from being a autonomy supportive coach or being a person-centered coach. Uh, it might just seem like, oh, you know what, you're just talking about motor learning and I understand what's wrong here, but that has nothing to do with being a client-centered coach. And I'd say, I think it actually does. And I'm going to talk about it just a little bit here so you get it. So this is a hilarious example of when you go to a meet and literally every step of the way, the coach is yelling at cue at them. They start to do the walkout and you hear three steps and do a three-step walkout. And then as soon as they get set, right after they get the squat command, big breath. And then when they're coming, you know, down into the hole, knees out, knees out, up, hips, wait for the rack. So you're hearing all these cues and it almost seems like the coach thinks that I'm the marionette. I'm, I'm the verbal marionette telling you what to do. And if I didn't say anything, heck, you know, you wouldn't take a breath. You wouldn't take three-step walkout. Your knees would cave in. You would, you'd stay in the hole. You wouldn't come up or you wouldn't know where depth was. You wouldn't know what hips mean, but honestly, does anyone know what hips means? And then you wouldn't wait for the rack command and you get a red light. And let's say best case scenario, that's actually true. How dependent is that athlete on your cues? Are you, you're, you're literally not supporting their autonomy. <laughs> you're literally saying you need me to say the things that you, you know how to, you don't know how to do on your own, or you can't even do a squat. And yes, there are issues here from a motor learning perspective. You know, if you really want to become an expert of the task, it has to become automatic. And I'm not saying you should never use cues. Don't get me wrong. Cues might be part of that learning process. But if you're at a powerlifting meet on game day and you think your athlete needs to hear a cue at every step of the way, are you a coach or are you a crutch? Just something to think about. And I've actually heard a very high level powerlifting coach talking about a world champion and talking about a specific meet where they weren't able to go and support that athlete. And they said, you know what? They, they missed that one lift because I wasn't there to tell them the cue because they never do it right when I'm not there. And that's literally an example of a coach failing at supporting the autonomy of a lifter. Maybe they tried, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying they're a bad coach or anything like that, but the role of the coach is to be able to make that athlete able to do this stuff, to support their autonomy. So if you're not able to be there, or if you're running back and forth to the warm-up room, you, maybe you're the coach for the whole team. Uh, maybe you physically can't make the trip or whatever. Or, hey, you're a remote coach. 
They've got a different platform coach and also they're training all the time. You physically can't be there to tell them these things. So how do you support your athlete? How do you support their autonomy to help them perform better in terms of actual lifting? And this is a great lesson for both remote coaches who get a lot of lifting feedback for platform powerlifting coaches or weightlifting coaches, and also for in-person personal trainers. And let's take another example. All right, in this example, we've got this athlete who's just finished his squat set, and we've got the coach. She comes over and she says, great set. I can tell you went through your performance checklist we developed. Shall we review the video to see if there's anything to work on? If so, we can make some cues that click with you to use for a while to ingrain any changes. Now, this is a slightly different example, but I want to point out a few things here. She's not doing it right because she's not yelling cues at him. And there's not, I'm not saying there's never a time to use verbal cues. Absolutely there are. But I want to show some things of how she supported this client's autonomy. First, I can tell you went through your performance checklist we developed. So that implies that they spent some time previously and she's taught this lifter to go, you know what, I want you to have a step-by-step checklist of how you perform a lift that you go through it each and every time, focusing on the process so it eventually becomes ingrained and it's something you can do automatically on your own. It's part of the motor learning process. And maybe there were cues initially that came from that checklist that really stuck for that lifter, but now he's at a point where he just goes through the checklist on his own. But getting feedback, hey, what do you think about looking at the video of the set together? And then if we can both identify some things that, oh, you know, the checklist is good, but here and here, I still need to do a few things. Now maybe we can, we can make some cues that click with you. These aren't just general cues like hips that are just kind of yelled at everybody in the same way or up. These are cues that we think are personalized for the athlete that we developed together based upon what we think is still needs to be worked on. And then we'll use them for a while specifically for the purpose of ingraining those changes. So this is all about making the lifter more adaptable more resilient. So they don't necessarily need you there every single time. You're facilitating their ability to be autonomous and to become more competent. And now they're, the, they're going to succeed even if you can't be there yelling at them on the platform. And of course, there will be a time and place where you are giving cues as part of that motor learning process, which is almost endless. If you decide to change form, if they get injured and have to go back up to heavy weights, absolutely, you can facilitate that. But it's not just using the same cues and a whole bunch of them all the time and saying, you know what, if I'm not physically there, they're going to perform worse. Again, are you a coach or are you a crutch? So we've given one, now we're getting into some examples that you might be like, oh shit, I didn't really see how that was related to autonomy supported coaching. And this last one I think is maybe the most ambiguous because it's a very understandable response of the coach to the check-in. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at here. And I don't think there's anything malicious or wrong about this, but I think there's a missed opportunity. Okay, so here's the interaction. Coach, I had a rough week, but I stayed on track. I thought about what you'd think if I didn't stay on track, because the last thing I want to do is let you down. And the coach says, Jay, you're an awesome athlete to work with. I know you won't let me down. Great job staying on track. Keep it up. Now, honestly, if, if I just heard some this conversation next to me, it wouldn't set off alarm bells. I wouldn't think this is a terrible coach. I'm not saying the person is, but... I think if we hold true to the underlying philosophy of what we're trying to do and what makes athletes tick or people tick and how they do hard things, there is an opportunity here. And I want to highlight it with this different response. Jay, you're an awesome athlete to work with. Great job staying on track. And just so you know, if you hadn't stayed on track, I still have the same respect and appreciation for you. Truly, you can't let me down because I'm here to support your goals. In fact, if you're up for it, I think it'd be great to revisit them. I wonder if doing so might make for fewer, tougher weeks moving forward. Now, I want that, that, again, coach didn't do anything massively wrong the first time, but they did miss an opportunity. So if we think back to the spectrum of motivation that moves towards intrinsic being the highest value motivation, this athlete is basically saying, hey, the only thing that kept me on track was extrinsic motivation. I had a rough week, and what kept me there was thinking about the fact that I might let you down. And that's not a bad thing. Like I said, you can have extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation, but we really want to make sure the client has intrinsic motivation. And what this second opportunity that it wasn't missed by this coach and the uh, the, the ideal response, if you will, pointed out to them that, hey, remember why I'm here. I'm here to support you. 
you know what? You can't let me down. And, and that's not just a throwaway statement. I want you to think about that philosophically. If the client is not doing something and they've let you down, whose goals are they, right? If you're more disappointed about the lack of adherence than the athlete, it's about you now. It's not about them. If they're not disappointed, they didn't care. If they didn't care, that means their motivation isn't there. If their motivation isn't there, that means they're not actually connected to their goals. And that's what the missed opportunity is. If you can actually recognize this for what it is, it's saying, hey, I've lost intrinsic motivation or I've forgotten the intrinsic motivation that made me want to do this. And now the only person I'm worried about letting down is the coach and not myself. There's a problem. So what, we, what can we do about that? Well, you know what? We need to sit down and talk because I clearly don't understand what you are motivated to do and what you're not motivated to do. And maybe you don't understand it either. So I'm going to hear, help you facilitate uh, an introspective look into your own goals. I'm going to ask you some questions, of course, up your, if, you, if you're up for it. And if we re- revisit our goals and we realize, you know what? These aren't perfectly in line with what I want to do. No wonder I wasn't motivated to do it. And no wonder I wasn't thinking about letting myself down because I didn't care, right? I didn't realize it, but I was thinking about letting you down. But you know what? If we can get these goals in better alignment with my values, my interests, and we can really leverage self-determination theory and now direct that, boom, I'm going to be able to stick to this plan and I will get through those rough weeks moving forward because I'm motivated to do so. And I don't have to use, you know, my coach as kind of this, this, uh, this, this, this voice on next to my ear on my shoulder. And something wrong with them doing that, of course. Um, but now at least they can start to recognize what this means. And you recognize it, and this can be caught earlier, and you can start to have a greater adherence rate and therefore higher motivation and therefore greater success. So hopefully these real-world examples where I moved from kind of ridiculous, you know, terrible coach, one-week transformation, marketing all about them to some really kind of subtle gray zones where I think many coaches who are quite good might find themselves saying or doing similar things and not realizing maybe it's not philosophically in line with the approach they should take is useful. So I really hope we were able to go from theory to practice. Thank you for sticking through this whole video and I'll see you next month.